You guys know that a large number of our audience is uh, made up of nurses, nursing assistants, LVNs, like the entire spectrum of nursing. And that's always been a big sort of point of pride for me because doctors are such a-holes in general. And when we can actually all come together as a team, think of the damage we could do to the healthcare system in a good way, right? So today I have a very special guest and I wanna say hi to Colleen, Sarah, Audra, Amanda, our first uh, people here. We got about 500 people watching live. Kimberly Ding is a clinical nursing instructor and at, at, a, at, a, at a school in San Francisco, a university in San Francisco that shall rena- remain unnamed. <laughs> and she is here to talk to us about nursing education, how it's changed, how it's crucial for the future. And we're going to take your comments and questions. Kim Ding, welcome to the show. Hi, Z Dog. I am so <laughs> excited to be here. Dude, <laughs> I, well, okay, I got to say this. The reason that we met is you were in our video, and yes. the Z Pack will remember this. I try the Macy Gray parody. <laughs> I tried a suction tin and it chokes. You were the nurse in that video. I was. That was. That was such a great memory. I loved working with you then. And you were you you kind of have done some acting and stuff too, right? Yeah, I yeah. have. I've done a little bit of some commercials here and there, and I'm trying to get back into that. That's kind of awesome. <laughs> yeah. So when 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 you were so awesome in that video, I'm like, dude, I got to have Kim back on. And when I moved back to the Bay Area, it turns out we're like neighbors, right? I can't we won't that. say the city because you know, <clears throat> anti vaxxers Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. But you, you know, your husband's an interventional radiologist. Right. Uh, my wife's a chest radiologist, and I was like, dude, we were meant to be on we a show were. together. We were. So here we are. Thank you for having me, dude. <laughs> so there's so much stuff we were talking about what we could talk about because you're you know you're a nursing instructor at a major nursing school, right? Yes. And you and I were kind of commiserating about how all of healthcare has changed so much, but nursing in particular has become so much about clicking boxes and following these protocols and not using critical thinking. And, mm-hmm. and so I'm curious as an instructor, like what have you seen and how do you think you can make it better? Because if it continues to sort of degrade the way it has, then it we really are commodities. We're no longer, you know, in this beautiful, sacred relationship with our patients. We're machines that can easily be replaced by some kind of AI. So curious what your thoughts are. Well, um, first of all, that's why I love nursing education, because I believe that um, really me just being able to teach my students, it starts at that foundation where I am with the students. They are like my own children. So what I do and how I teach them. Do you change their diapers? (laughs) (laughs) Sometimes I do have to give them a timeout. Sometimes I do have to give them a timeout. But um, really being able to educate them is the foundation. I always tell them, you know, you guys are like my children. So if I do a good job, you're a reflection of me. Mm. Um, and so I'm, I'm very passionate. And I think that giving them a good foundation and starting from school will be able to allow them to be compassionate, accountable leaders for this generation of nurses. And when they come in, though, are are you finding that they're generally ready for this kind of training or are they kind of conditioned by what we see the kind of Gen Z crowd? You know, they're phone based and they're not really looking people in the eye. I mean, what's going on? So that's a great that that's a really great topic because um, I do teach sophomores and I teach undergrads. So there are some challenges with that. For example, um, just good manners. You know, teaching them good manners, that when you walk into a room, you make eye contact, being professional, being on time, um, being accountable for your work. And then there's other sort of other little facets such as um, social media. I have to remind them, I go over the syllabus with them that with social media, you cannot take pictures of yourself with patients. (laughs) Uh, You cannot uh, really comment so poorly about, you know, having a bad day at your university at this specific hospital. So just teaching them common sense and critical thinking for for my students. So, 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 but it's interesting because, you know, you're talking about manners and stuff. I, I think there are a lot of doctors who could learn these lessons too. And we see it actually one of the big challenges in medical education for medical students is teaching them simple manners and human skills and, you know, these kind of things that we would take for granted maybe in our generation. But 
it's not even a generational thing. It's more that h- how the internet has affected how we interact with people has changed our wiring a little bit to where we're, we're willing to accept kind of behavior that's really not okay. Right. And professionalism, which is the fancy way of saying being a decent human being right. in your job. And you said something where you said, uh, uh, you know, taking pictures, of, uh, talking about, so bitching about like a bad day at work right. and then naming the specific hospital and this kind of thing. People don't understand. Like, it's great to vent on social media. That's wonderful. We, right. our platform is all about communalizing pain, right? Absolutely. And saying, hey, we're all in this, right? Yeah. But when you say, oh, at this hospital, on this ward, because then what starts to happen is you come perilously close to violating HIPAA, to right. making your employer angry because you're reflecting on them, this sort of thing. Now, the truth is, in if you're asking me, I'm like, yeah, fight the power. We should be screaming and yelling when our employer is being bad. But the tr- but the but, but the practicalities of it is that's a great way to lose your job. Exactly. There are better ways to speak out in a in a way that is not going to get you uh, canned. So do you do you actually literally teach them this, or how do you how do you like? Yeah, it's absolutely. On our very first day, we have orientation, and I go through the syllabus with them, and I have to specific. I have a category about social media, exactly how you're supposed to act with, you know, with Instagramming, Facebooking, what you can or can't say, um, even grooming, Z dog. You know, I'm a <laughs> big fan of grooming myself. I mean, you can tell that uh, my hair is done to the nine. So tell it's me about beautiful. grooming. This is hilarious. <clears throat> so okay. grooming. So grooming, um, all of my students are in white scrubs. So uh, what you wear under your white scrubs uh, can be visible. So <laughs> just the simple act of being professional and being uh, careful with what you wear. Uh, women have to keep their hair back. It's just like working at a restaurant. You need to keep your hair back, minimal jewelry, visible tattoos let me see that thong is that that's what you're really getting at right that Black thong, thong 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 thong, thong. thong. cis quo exactly. yeah that's what it is exactly so, they have to do the bend over uh challenge and if you can see something then you need to change it, so. it, it I, this i wish this could carry over again because it starts with education but right. in the hospital because there's always gym the nurse who's like scrubs are 4x too tight and you're basically right. seeing taint a lot like right. and taint is not something that you want to visualize absolutely no and the thing is um it's customer service right mm. because if you come to work looking like that and if you come to work looking messy then that means that you're going to be a messy nurse mm. Mm. and you know the, the the phrase customer service will trigger a bunch of people right because they'll say well now we're not a hotel this is a life-saving thing mm-hmm. but see i always make a distinction like the idea of customer service is really the idea of what is the experience of the patient. Right. So we talk about patient satisfaction. That makes me want to hurl. We should be talking about the patient experience. Absolutely. Because when you're a patient or you're there with your loved ones, you have a certain experience. And when it's bad, like I recently had a horrible experience getting mm-hmm. flu shots at my big multi-specialty group that shall remain mm-hmm. nameless, even though I named them once. And, um, and it was such a bad experience oh. that I came away being like, you know what? Target's going to eat your lunch. Target gives a vastly better flu shot experience mm-hmm. than you gave. And mm-hmm. if you're looking to create a, 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 a place where people want to get a flu shot, where they want to like uh, come and see you, right. you failed. And mm-hmm. so that, that then gets right to the heart of the professionalism issue that you're talking about. So if, if, mm-hmm. if your doctor, your nurse is totally unkempt and, you know, but now how does this relate to things like so we're going to get real here, like tattoos and colored hair and stuff like that, because a lot of our fans are like inked up and they have to cover up and their employer makes sure that, you know, and the multiple piercings and things like that. And what's your take on that? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, my own personal take is that, uh, hmm, that's a great question. That you have to think about. I is, have to think about is interesting that. because it makes you go, mm, it is a tension, right? right? Between personal liberty, personal expression. Absolutely. And and I can't really speak for that because every hospital has its own different policies and its own different protocols. Um, the university also has its own different protocols for that too. Right, right. So you kind of, it's kind of employer specific. Mm-hmm. I mean, my feeling is you should be able to express yourself within the parameters of what, you know, a quorum of people would consider 
professional. professional. Right. Absolutely. So if you have like a 666 tattooed on the center <laughs> of your head and your hair is mohawked and blue right. and you're covered in sleeves of tats that say Satan loves mom, <laughs> that might be like, you know, a little difficult for a patient who maybe has a religious background or something like that. So, Absolutely. so you're always kind of weighing those things. Doctors, it's interesting because I think doctors feel particularly hamstrung by professional Mm -hmm. rigors. They can't even speak out online. They can't have a voice. Nurses seem to be a little more open online. They're more like, oh, let me tell you about it. Sometimes to the point where, you know, like we, 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 we've done shows about nurses who've said things online that really have crossed the line or violated HIPAA or, you know, whatever. So this professionalism you're trying to instill from kind of day one, right? Right. I just want that me as a nurse or my nursing students, when they are in a patient room, that the patients feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. So my students can make their own judgment or their, use their own common sense to see how they can groom themselves that way. How do you deal with racist patients or patients who clearly are making you feel uncomfortable? Oh, I, I remember I had, um, I had an incident before when I was working at a hospital in San Francisco. Um, and there was a veteran who was in a psychosis right now. We can't figure out which hospital this is, by right. the way. Yeah. <laughs> we have no idea yeah. which hospital. Which hospital would serve any veterans, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and he thought he was in the Vietnam War. Mm. And so I walked in as an oh, Asian no. woman. Yes. And um, You're Filipina? And I'm Filipina. Yeah. Yeah, but so he was shout like, out, but he thought I was I'm ethnically ambiguous, right? As an Asian as an Asian female nurse. I not go. I not go. <laughs> <laughs> so, so so what happened? So he yelled at me and he was throwing objects at me and he's like, I don't want to be taken care of by you. I out of here. He he I don't want you. Oh, wow. So even I've even experienced um, uh, just patients not wanting to be taken care of by a female nurse, too. Really? So what do we do? Well, hmm. That's a little difficult. Mm. That's, a, that's a little difficult because it is my moral code that I still have to take care of the patients. Now, if it gets really aggressive, then I can hand my patient over to another nurse. Right. So um, right. that day I just had to suck it up. Right. Well, you know, there was a story that we did about the, this nurse who went on a forum and was talking about she had to, she punched her patient like square in the balls. The nurse. The nurse punched did. Punched yeah. her patient. Right. Oh but, my goodness. But this, so here's the backstory. Mm -hmm. So as a, as a nursing instructor, I'd love your take on this. So mm -hmm. she was in the room with a male nurse supervisor. Okay. And she was telling this male nurse that this patient was violent and she did not feel safe. And the male nurse did not have, did not intervene. In other words, as the supervisor did not do anything to improve the situation. Next thing you know, the patient, like, I think grabbed or punched at this nurse and she reacted instinctively to try to get him off and just kind of mm -hmm. hit him square in the crotch. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think even the family had kind of said, it's okay. He's very agitated and violent mm -hmm. and he does this and you know but it was a big deal because mm -hmm. you don't hit patients ever right. right right but in this situation it was such a strange thing because the patient was violent and she was trying to defend herself at the same time she recognized what she did was wrong and was very scared and mm -hmm. i mean what how would you process something like that as say a nurse educator oh that's really difficult because as a nurse educator or just as a nurse you need to keep your patients safe but that kind of sounds like to me um, self-defense mm. because you're telling me because I'm hearing that no one was the other male nurse was not protecting her. Mm -hmm. And so she was trying to protect herself. That's the story. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that that's. That's, that goes in line with moral injury. Yeah. <laughs> that goes in line with, with moral injury and in your, in your um, podcast for that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I think you need to protect yourself. So, so, so this gets at the heart of it now because we're seeing increased violence in hospitals, increased substance abuse, increased mm -hmm. sort of perception among patients that they are a customer and that the customer is always right. And mm -hmm. if they're mistreated, they would yell and scream the way they would yell at scream at McDonald's if someone got their McFlurry wrong. Right. Or, but the difference here is they're <clears throat> particularly emotional and maybe even the combination of, you know, 
scared, emotional family, having the worst day of their life, patient, drugs, medications, everything, they're getting increasingly violent. And we feel hamstrung because it's hard to defend ourselves, right? Because mm-hmm. we're afraid we're going to lose our job. Right. If we press charges, uh, the hospital doesn't support. Mm-hmm. The law enforcement sometimes doesn't support because it's they're like, look, this happens all the time. It's part of the job. It's right. part of you know. How, you've been through this yourself. I have. Can you can you tell that story? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, this happened several years ago. Um, I was the charge nurse at that time on a medical unit in a hospital in Boston. And again, they're not, you know, uh, we won't say which hospital. It's like when, yeah, I went to school in Boston. You're right. Uh-huh. Yeah. Did you go to Boston Community College? Probably not. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> right, right. Um, so I was the charge nurse on a medical unit. I was working on a med surge, specifically a me- medical unit. And there was a patient, I think she was about, there was a patient who was maybe in her 40s, female patient who came in for a psychosis. I think she had an altercation with her her teacher. Oh. So this patient was supposed to be placed on a psych unit. But as an internist, you know that the patients kind of get turfed into medicine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does that, is that resounding to you? Uh, You know, I mean, the potassium was 3.4. So that's a medical problem. Exactly. So we'll go ahead and admit to medicine until she's stabilized. Exactly. Especially when there are no beds. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yes, I think, you know, combination of that and also that there just wasn't any uh, beds available on the psych at the psych facility. So she came to our unit. Um, She was um, she had a sitter with her Mm. because she was either harm to herself or flight risk. And so she was on our unit for at least 24 hours. Mm. And the problem is that this is a medical unit. Right. So although for nurses, we definitely know how to be compassionate and take care of patients, but we are also not super qualified on how to on a medical unit, how to take care of psych patients. I don't you know, I don't know the pathway. I don't know the medication pathway of how to how to manage, you know, Ativan and uh whatever medication that you have to give for that. I mean, you just said it just, it's just Ativan. Is it just Ativan? Times a thousand milligrams. Right. <laughs> and, and then, and just throw some Haldol in, just icing on the cake, man. That's, that's what it is, it, right? Yeah, that's a, that's absolutely wrong. But <laughs> uh, it feels right to me in my heart. And that's what matters because my feelings matter. Okay, Kim <laughs> They Ding. do. They yeah. do. So, so, so you, so the point being, you're not, you're not, you're not a psych nurse. Right. And the psych nurses themselves have, have reached out to me saying, man, it's hard. What we do is really hard. You got to learn to imagine. de-escalate these guys. Right. Sometimes you got to, you know, you got to go off the top rope with the elbow, the people's elbow mm-hmm. and just go right to the, right to the solar plexus. <laughs> uh, and they don't say that, but I'm reading between the lines. And so, so that, so what happened then? Okay. So, um, I heard her escalating and I went into the room and she said, I said, hi, um, what's going on? Can I help you? And she mm. went like this come here. Okay. Z dog. What would you do if a patient said, come here? I'd be like, I, immediately I'd put on whatever that funky mask that uh, hockey goalies wear. <laughs> Cause I'm like, something's going to happen. She's going to poke me in the eyes or no, I would just be, I would be very circumspect about that. Right. And yeah. I wasn't because I wasn't trained. So I uh, went there and I said, yes, can I help you? The door was open. The sitter was by the sitter yeah. was um, by the door. And I went over and she, and she said, I need my medication. And she grabbed me by the hair and she threw me on the bed. Oh and my God. The only, and she, she bulldozed me. And I was just thinking to myself, the only thing that was going through my mind was number one, I don't want to die right now. Oh my God. And number two, was there a sharp object on her bedside table, like a pencil or a fork or something? Because I wasn't sure what she was going to do to my back because she had me hovered over me on top of me on the bed. And the sitter, you know, sitters cannot touch patients. And I was just yelling and I just said, help, help. And everybody came in. It took at least five nurses and physicians to take her off of me. And then this patient who could not be placed in a psych facility was immediately placed within several minutes. Wow. At least they did something. Right. Right. But that's right. still, a, you know, and, and <clears throat> I imagine you still have some, the way you tell the story, you have vivid memories of this. Right. right? I had PTSD after that. Yeah. It, it took a while to, yeah. um, to heal from that. It's very scary, uh, you know, and we, we, and you think, you know, the, the, the interesting thing is like, since n- nurses are predominantly female, mm-hmm. 
this is often violence against females, which isn't what we talk about publicly. That's what it is. It's a it's often men physically assaulting women right. in a place of healing. Mm -hmm. In this case, it was a woman physically assaulting a woman. But right. I, I want to say this: it's not always that the case. So we had um, Jimmy on our show, as nurse mm -hmm. from Nashville. He told a story about a psych patient in the emergency. He's an emergency nurse, psych patient in the emergency department grabbed a female psych patient, mm -hmm. grabbed him by the stethoscope and twisted it and nearly strangled him. Oh my and when he tried to press charges, it was an ordeal trying to press charges because he's like, this is attempted murder. She was in her right mind. That's the thing. Oh, that's so, that you know, and, and again, because we can always make that argument, well, they're delirious or they're psychotic or they're ex. Right. This patient had been medicated, other things. So, we, we, we really need to start thinking. There's national stuff going on in Congress now about bills about protecting healthcare workers. Um, but I think we really need to call it what it is, which is more often than not, it is violence against female practitioners. Yeah. It's a power differential between the patient and the practitioner, whereas normally the power differential is the other way, right? The patient's vulnerable, and sometimes maybe that's why they're trying to assert control. Right. But we have to do a lot better than we've been doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm really sorry you had to go through that. Yeah, that's thank terrible. You. Uh, and, and you know it was weird as as a male doctor and i'm i'm not i'm five foot five i'm not a physically imposing person <laughs> but i've never been physically assaulted by a patient okay you know i felt spider sense tingling like something like stuff's gonna go down right right um but it, it it never it never really happened so for me personally i haven't had that experience but then you look at it's interesting so nurses get assaulted mm -hmm. and sometimes you know severely like there was an army nurse who was lit on fire by a coworker. Right. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it was terrible. Uh, and, and uh, you know, then we had that nurse who was taken hostage at Del Nor and raped and terrible things happened oh by an inmate. But then physicians, often when they are assaulted, they are murdered. Oh. So, yeah, it's more like the patient has a specific, you know, thing going on and it, it happens again and again and again. So physicians lose their lives. So it's really interesting. I think this is something that we need to keep screaming and talking about. There's a reporter in, uh, in Kentucky, I think, who is doing a series now, uh, Paula Vassan. And mm -hmm. actually she's, she's talking quite a bit about it. So we could try to share her stuff whenever we can, because it needs to be a national conversation. Okay. How do you talk to your students about this? Do you, is this part of the curriculum? Uh, I, you know, I do. And they are, feel so fascinated. They love hearing the stories about that. But I specifically give them more practical tips. Right. For example, especially as students, always keep your door open when you go in. Mm. Go in pairs. Um, I also don't put them in a situation where I, uh, where I know that a patient um, is aggressive. I, I don't. I don't assign them to. A, I protect them that way. Mm. I protect them with the patient assignments that they received, and just giving them practical tips. And I always tell them now, now because I know, now I've experienced it. If you feel in your gut that you, if you don't feel safe, don't go in there. Mm. Come and call me, or or bring a colleague with you, or bring another nurse with you. Right. Because what you're feeling is probably. Is probably true. Probably legit. Right. Yeah. Because we, have, as humans, we, our elephant, our unconscious is designed as a threat detector. Mm -hmm. So it has a fear bias, right? So right. it's always looking for stuff. And mm -hmm. if you feel something, spider sense tingling, mm -hmm. it's probably something going on, right? right. Now, imagine though, you know, again, and, uh, you know, putting yourself in the patient's shoes, if violence is all you've ever known growing up mm -hmm. and all of that, and then you're in a situation where you're powerless, mm -hmm. you can see why they would think that's a reasonable option. And I think we need to quickly disabuse them of that by making the penalties for that behavior yeah. so egregious and so unbearable for the patient. Right. In other words, and, and you really, I think about it, like, say you're in your right mind mm -hmm. and you assault a healthcare professional. What if you go to jail for the rest of your life for that? What if it's like a three strikes and you're done immediately? You know, what if, what if you make it, and again, I'm not saying that this is what we should do, but imagine if the penalties were so severe and they knew that. So there's signs all over the hospital. Mm -hmm. The problem is I think a lot of hospital administrators don't want to make it look like a militarized zone, mm -hmm. right? So they don't want, but, but there are some hospitals and people share this with me where they say, hey, uh, there's signs that say violence against healthcare professionals, including verbal violence, will not be tolerated and will be met with, with legal action. So you'll go to jail. Yeah. And I think that's that in itself that people realize that it's not, the boundaries are set. Mm -hmm. It's probably part of it.
So let me let me change the subject for a second here. Actually, let's take some comments because there's so many people commenting, sending stars, doing all this fun stuff. Um, let's see. Uh, Tony Frank, he says, a reading as I listen, so many providers have been assaulted by patients. This must be addressed now, not later. We've got to stand united as healthcare providers for protection. So what I think is, like you and me, doctors and nurses sitting at a table, we don't do that. We don't. Why? Why do you think we don't do that? I've seen it. doctors and nurses just don't really work well together. I don't know why. <laughs> That's honest. <laughs> Elaborate on that. Uh, why is that? I think because, uh, why do you think? Why do you think Z-Dog? That's such an educator thing to do, throw it back. At the <laughs> so t let me ask you, what do you think? Well, so, you know, it's interesting. I think we have, if you're asking me, Mm -hmm. I think we have very different ways of seeing the world. Mm -hmm. I think we, there is a, uh, there's a real interesting dynamic uh, uh, between female nurses and female doctors that, yes. you, you, you're nodding like you recognize this. So t t tell me what your take on that is and I'll tell you mine. We'll exchange takes because I think this is a, very important one because my female physician and nurse colleagues tell me this is a real thing that nobody talks about. And it's that, you know, f nurses are known to bully each other. Like they're known to eat their young. Mm -hmm. It's like part of the, there's something cultural. Doctors do it, but they do it in a very different way. It's part of the hierarchy mm -hmm. and it's, um, it's not so much, you know, like residents don't bully residents and mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not as much that it's more like the attendings in a hole and you know, <laughs> the surgeon's an a-hole and, and that sort of thing. And there's sexism, but it's all kind of, it's all codified in this hierarchy. And But with with female nurses and female doctors, female nurses will call a female doctor by their first name. They will not do that to a male doctor. Mm -hmm. They will um, question a female doctor's orders openly, refuse to carry them out. They will not do that to a male doctor. So mm -hmm. there's almost like mm -hmm. a kind of a, a reverse sexism that goes yes. on. And my female physician colleagues tell me about this, which is why then you see the behavior on the part of the female physicians. They are they can be really nasty about nurses, particularly mm -hmm. nurse practitioners, mm -hmm. who they will go on and on and on and say they're not qualified, they, they shouldn't have practice rights, they're dumb, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like this kind of like right. return of the bullying. Right. I see that. So do you, have you seen that? Have you, or do you think you just, you kind of conceptually can see that? I, I've seen it. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, the, the, um, I think women, I shouldn't generalize about women, but we, we don't like being told what to do. And I think we don't like being told what to do by other females. Mm. Um, also the, medicine is changing right mm -hmm. now that we have a lot of female physicians and that's that's phenomenal that's great and so before before men were the physicians right mm. and now women are becoming physicians and so maybe there's a power struggle between women maybe there's insecurity with that mm. Mm. I, th I think that maybe that because that's what bullying is right yeah is insecurity are you in insecure in your own role well, as a nurse, you shouldn't be because you are a nurse. You are, you are there to be with your patients. And the way I see it is that, and I have a lot of uh, f female physician friends, is that we work together. So even though we do have different roles, we work together and we work together well so that we can take care of our patients. Mm. Let me let me theorize something. See, this is this to me is fascinating because this is human dynamics, right? Mm -hmm. At its finest. We're, we're tribal creatures barely pulled out of this kind of environment where mm. it is it's all these kind of um interesting relationships so like the old male hierarchy of, of dominance right. you know d there's a, there's a certain feeling that well you know it's not just a doctor on nurse dominance hierarchy it's right. a male on female dominance hierarchy and you wonder about that mm -hmm. especially in the older days now we're starting to see those hierarchies begin to be challenged and flattened finally mm -hmm. and and Maybe now there's more discourse that would have happened early on if there wasn't that dominance hierarchy to begin with. Right. Because nurses have a skill set and things they bring to the table that doctors absolutely lack and vice versa. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And when you and I sit across the table, we can share those things. And, you know, you're married to a doctor, so you probably share those things, yes. right? And, um, but it hasn't classically been that way. We've been right. siloed off. Mm -hmm. It's been part of a hierarchical dominance. Like the doctor gives orders, the nurses carry out orders. Mm -hmm. The nurse expresses concern. The doctor either blows it off or pretends that he's blowing it off and then takes it seriously. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so those days are gone and they yes. should be gone. Right. You know, one thing I learned, and this is what I teach medical students too, is like the biggest piece of advice I can give you is, and this is old advice, mm -hmm. but I think it has a new meaning now, which is the nurses are your allies, the most mm -hmm. powerful allies you'll ever have. Don't see them as the enemy or someone to be, you know, conquered or dominated or won over or whatever. It, it, yeah. They're your allies. And if you treat them as such, they will help you and you will help them in service of the patient, but also in service of each other. Mm -hmm. And so to this day, you know, I have um, nursing allies and friends across the, the wards at Stanford mm -hmm. because that's how I, I tried to live that. And, and, and I have to say, it may have been the exception. Mm -hmm. uh, so as, an edu as educators, both of us, mm -hmm. right, I think that's something we would want to really impart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How interesting, right? Yeah, it, it, very interesting. Yeah. It, I think that it's going to change though. I see it changing, especially nowadays. So I have two kids mm. and I have two boys, but I make it a point that I read to them books about strong female leaders because that's what's happening now. We are entering a generation where men and women can both be anything they want. And now we have more awareness with that and children are now we are we are encouraging them to be open to any type of career or identity for this new generation. So I, I'm hoping that my children, the children for today, are the children of today, are going to be are going to grow into someone that's just so accepting of everything, and that we can all work together well. Mm. Um, I, I think it's happening. It, yeah, I think it's happening. I think this next generation is much more non-hierarchical sexism is much right. less of a thing racism seems seems to be much less of course we mm -hmm. live in a little bit of a bubble here absolutely but even <laughs> even even you know even in other places where i've gone things things are changing so much mm -hmm. and the, yeah there's a backlash against it and yeah you know you have this sort of ebb and flow but i think mm -hmm. overall things are going to get better but mm -hmm. you'll have these weird sort of transition zones right yeah I do. I, I always tell my students too, as educators, you have to respect each other mm. because that's the key to success is being able to work with each other as a team. Mm. D do you agree? Yeah. Team, being a team player. So more than anything. Right. And yeah. that means being able to work with other nurses, respecting your nursing assistants, because our nursing assistants are their gems. They are our treasures and they are always with the patients. Mm. Mm. And so they, they need to respect um, house, housekeeping mm. because I don't know in your experience, but sometimes the housekeepers are the first ones in the room and they find that the patient has coded dude, because they're in there all the time. Dude, there's so many uh, housekeepers that are fans of the show that message me and they tell me stories about really being there on the front line, right? They and, are. and feeling very disrespected. You know, uh, yeah. but th this is everybody in the hospital is a team. That that right. was the one reason I could do that job for so many years mm -hmm. is that you knew there was this right. huge support network, Absolutely. even with the politics and the drama right. that happens in these kind of tribal things. But yeah. it, it's it's tremendous, and the best team players are the best doctors and the best nurses right. and the best housekeepers, and because they they connect with everybody around them. Absolutely, and lift them up and focus on their strengths instead of their weaknesses and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Leaders too, right? That mm -hmm. recognize the team. That's right. Yeah, that it's not a dominance thing. It's interesting. So Daisy Miller chimes in and says, if that's the case with this generation, in quotes, why then the bullying? So this is what I think about bullying in the next generation. Mm -hmm. So you have these kids, right, that are, <clears throat> that, are, <clears throat> that are bullying each other on social media to the point where they're committing, mm -hmm. you know, they're dying by suicide and this and that. Terrible. Now, this is what I think, and Jonathan Hyde and others have written about this. Uh, what we've done is we've taken the basic tendency of humans to commit relational aggression, AKA bullying, mm -hmm. especially when they're younger and we've weaponized it by giving them social media. Mm -hmm. So now it has no consequences for the bully 
and the bullied person has nowhere to escape. So it used to be if you were bullied, you're bullied at school and then you go home and you're safe. Mm -hmm. Now it's like you go home and you open your Instagram and someone's there making fun of you, right? right? So that's part of the problem is our technology has outpaced our, our evolutionary wiring. And now we've weaponized relational aggression, which is why I did a show talking about, I don't think girls should have social media until they're 18. I right? agree. Right? Yes. Why, why do you, what, what's your experience? And, and should we apply this to boys too? And the reason I, I left boys out is that mm -hmm. boys commit physical aggression much mm -hmm. more than relational aggression. It's not yeah. uniquely true, but you wouldn't give a boy a gun at age 15 without training and say, here's a gun. Because right. he will go and kill someone because right. they're, they're, they're impulsive, physically mm -hmm. aggressive. Girls, it's relational aggression. Right. They bully, they, they try to harm each other's reputations. Very hard to do that word of mouth mm -hmm. without, without, you know, in a, in a nuclear way, but with social media, it goes nuclear. Right, for, because for, for young, for women, for, especially for young girls who are so vulnerable, uh, there's a lot in social media that, that can create insecurity, mm -hmm. just physical appearance, what their friend is doing, what they're not doing. Um, and they, they don't need that. Mm. And so what I'm, I make it a point that my children don't really see me on my phone. I have right. to put my phone away. Right. Because then they'll want a phone. Right? Have you no. got, you know, I had a friend who just went to flip phones just because they were done. Yeah. That's a great idea. It's, it's the nuclear option. It's like, I'm out. <laughs> if I did that, I'd no longer have a job. Because, you know, here, look, I mean, guys, this is, I'm looking at your comments on my non-flip phone let's actually let's take one of those uh, we all work as a team bullying has no place in healthcare. carolyn chandler it's true and yet yeah. there it is it's uh, so basic isn't it yeah i mean this is this is just like the playground like a preschool playground it, re that, re it really is it, it is you have to you know there's usually like a head honcho yep. and um alpha, and alpha alpha male, male or female or female yep. and uh, it starts young yeah and so how do we stop that by starting at home. Let's read this one, Ruth uh, Stevens King. Many physicians are impatient or short and don't wanna be bothered. Okay, who are you calling short? <laughs> Take that very personally. Um, as a nurse, we are not supposed to do anything without an order. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. I don't call to hear myself talk. I call because the patient needs something or I have a concern. Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty spot on. Mm -hmm. Doctors get very impatient because they're in a way, I think, in many ways, there's an insecurity component. We're mm -hmm. scared of killing someone. Mm -hmm. We're extremely tired, especially when we're taking call. Mm -hmm. So you're calling us in the middle of the night. A lot of times we get the feeling, and it's not necessarily accurate, we get the feeling that this nurse doesn't understand that I'm not a shift worker, <laughs> that this is hour 24, right. and that being woken up for a Tylenol order sounds really dumb, and I hate it, and now I'm angry, and I can't get back to sleep. Whereas the nurse is thinking, there's no order for Tylenol. This patient just needs Tylenol. I don't want to give morphine because that's dumb. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, my hands are tied, so I have to call for this order, right? right. If we could understand each other that way, mm -hmm. if we had potlucks where we all <laughs> came together, right, right then, then it would be much different. We'd walk a mile in each other's shoes, right? right? That's what's missing, I think. And communication. Yeah. Just simple communication, telling each other, this is what I need and this is how I'm feeling right now. Right. Especially as a physician who has been on call for 24 hours or a nurse who, I, I, I can think of so many instances where my patient really needs Tylenol right now because they have a fever. Right. And, but I feel bad because the doctor is sleeping and it's 3 a.m. But this, this patient needs Tylenol. And so you, just basic communication of saying, you know, I, I, I know you're tired right now, but we need to help our patient using the, our patient mm. um because we need to help him right now because he's gonna have a fever or he's in pain and right. just record i think recognizing each other's experience and i definitely do agree that going out and having that community bonding with the people you work with with other nurses with other nursing assistants with the housekeepers with physicians that's really good for uh, for increasing morality uh and having you know um having that friendship Mm. Because when you like the people you work with, then it makes the job easier, right? Much and it makes it so fun. Yeah. And I've had that experience working in San Francisco and working in Boston of of working with people that I love. Yeah. With my friends of all levels. I think that's a good takeaway point at the end here is uh it could be that way at, at almost every institution. Mm -hmm. If the culture is set 
from the bottom to the top that this is our idea is we're trying to connect. We're mm -hmm. all on a team. We're taking care of patients. Mm -hmm. The patients are actually part of the team. So mm -hmm. their voice is heard, their experience matters, but at the same time, so does ours. In other words, if we're made to feel unsafe, if we're made to, uh, or we're behaving unprofessionally because we haven't mm -hmm. been educated by Kim, uh, you know, <laughs> in school properly, then these things can be remedied in a compassionate way. Mm -hmm. We can uh, love each other without necessarily having to like each other sometimes. So there's okay. some people that just the personalities don't get along. Right. And this idea of being afraid to call people because you're worried about upsetting them or waking them up, I think it's so funny because that we operate from that place if we have any emotional intelligence. Right. So there are some people who just don't. They, 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 then that's fine. That's who they are. And they'll just call without remorse. Like for a stool softener? Like at, at 2 a.m.? Stool softener at 2 a.m. Right. Yeah. And they're the just like going sleeping. through the protocol. <laughs> they don't think that there's a human on the other end of the call. They're just going through the motions. And that's, right. you know, that may be that personality. But even that, that can be trained a little bit. Yeah. But we do. We think twice. We think if we all knew we were all friends, mm -hmm. then at least it'd be like, listen, and, and what you said was great. Hey, I know I'm really sorry to wake you up. Right. Now, I've had some nurses tell me, no, I never apologize because I'm doing my job. Okay, then don't don't use sorry. Right. Say, <laughs> I'm sorry that you had to be woken up for this, but here's what right. I need. Right. You to know? acknowledge someone's feelings. Acknowledge. Yeah. I see that you're tired, but right. I had to wake you up. And how about the doctors do something like thanking the nurses? <gasps> Wouldn't that be something? That would be so great. Oh, wow. You did something <laughs> really hard. We had you put in a Foley on an agitated patient who was doing all this stuff and you got it in and you never complained. And right. here we are, you know, at the nurse's station writing our note and we think that's hard. Right. And you've just done something that would have just kicked our ass. Like, thank you for that. Absolutely. I, I, I remember there were those were those moments that really bowled me over when I was uh, at Stanford. It's like when the nurses would just do something heroic and you're like, damn, like no one's going to thank you for that. I'm going to thank you because I'm just blown away, right? And that that just makes it wonderful. And then you're a little bit in awe right. of how good people are, you know? Thank you, Z-Dog. Oh. I'm saying thank you to you. How kind of you. Thank you, Kim Ding, for, <laughs> for joining us on this show and imparting your wisdom and bringing a positive spin to something that's hard, which is nursing education. Because um, you and I off off camera will complain about how hard it is and, you know, the students are changing. And But the truth is we do our best. And let, let, let's end with one last question. How many damn letters do you need behind your name to be a good nurse? Ah, oh, It all comes from the heart. Right. Nothing. Nothing. You just, just, just care about your patients. Just care about your patients. Care about your team. Right. I love it. So now all the BSN, MSN, <laughs> MSNBCs are like, you shut up. You need at least a CNBC behind your name. <laughs> well, you just have to remember why you went into nursing school. You went in because you love patients and you're passionate about what you do. You don't need all of the letters after your name. I love it. Kim Ding, come back on the show. I would love to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we got, uh, we got a lot of comments we can go through after the show. Thanks to everybody who uh, sent us stars to support the show. It's kind of awesome. Uh, give a shout out to your husband. Um, Thank you. He's doing great things in the world. Uh, and uh, let's have another, let's hang out sometime soon. I would love to. Thank awesome. you for having me. Thank you. Hit share, you punks. <laughs> By the way, we're now offering subscriptions on YouTube at three different tiers. So there's Super Pack. Four ninety nine a month, where you get to access to early exclusive content, live shows, Super Pack for Life, where you get just big ups from me personally. Nine ninety nine. That's just you want to support at a higher level. But then, this is my favorite one: Wakanda Forever. Ooh. Wakanda Forever, mm -hmm. forty nine ninety nine a month. So it's not a joke. But mm -hmm. this is what you get every month. I make you a personal video for you or your friends. So let's say it's a birthday month for, for a friend, up your membership to 49. And then I'm like, Hey, let me do, let me tell me the bullet points and I'll make you a cool video. And then a crazy bald man <laughs> shouts your friend out. So the nice thing about that is it allows us to support all the stuff that we do, like Victoria in the back. Woo -woo! Uh, Tom and Logan and Danielle and everybody uh, doing the thing that we do. So thanks for making all this possible, Z-Pack. Thank you, Kim Ding. Thank you, Z-Dog. And we out now. Victoria, I never told you how to stop the show. Watch this. I'm going to come over here. Check this out. <laughs> all right. We're going to come over here, and we're going to press end live video. Bye, everyone. Bye. And we hit OK. Bye.